Hazards, normally they are our counters, timers. Okay. Okay, so uh, as I've told you, there are different ways to classify sensors. Uh, one common uh, classification of sensors, it is in terms of whether it is a contact sensor or a non-contact sensor. When a sensor needs to be in contact, with the physical uh, medium in order to give the reading we will call it a, a contact uh, a contact a, a sensor that requires physical contact with the stimulus if it is not in contact with the stimulus it will not uh, give uh, proper proper reading whereas a non-contact sensor requires no physical contact for example an optical sensor for light or a position sensor infrared all these are non-contact uh, sensors Another way to classify sensors in terms of uh, whether it gives an uh, a absolute value or a relative uh, value. Okay, so absolute sensor is sensor that reacts to a stimulus on an absolute scale. So if uh, it moves there two unit, and here also it moves by corresponding, for example, a, a, a unit. Okay, so for example, strain go a gauges. Strain gauges measure strain on a on a material or whatever. So you need to, it is a contact sensor, then depending on how much it is expanding, this will translate to, a, to an absolute value. Uh, that is, the strain on this material is, is, so, is so much. Okay, there's a direct relationship between what is happening in the real world and what is the value that, that you are getting. Whereas a relative uh, sensor, a relative scale, the stimulus is sensed relative to a fixed or variable reference. So you have a reference point, you measure with respect to a reference. So thermocouple measures the temperature difference, for example, okay? And uh, pressure is often measured relative to atmospheric pressure. So pressure uh, in the air, whatever, it's only relative to an atmospheric pressure, by how much it is more or by how much it is less to the atmospheric pressure. So it doesn't translate to a pressure value uh, directly, but you need to subtract, add or subtract atmospheric pressure. So this is called a relative. A relative sensor. The other ways of classifying uh, uh, a sensors by its uh, broad area of detection, you have electric sensors. Most uh, often, we use electric sensors, magnetic sensors, electromagnetic sensors, acoustic for sound sensors, chemical sensors, optical for light sensors. Okay, heat, temperature, mechanical uh, sensors. All these are examples based on this uh, area of detection. You can classify it in terms by its physical law, law of physics or physical physical law, photoelectric sensors, so light in terms of electricity, magnetoelectric sensors in magnetic field to electric, thermoelectric sensors, temperature, thermo uh, means heat, okay, heat to electric, photoconductive, uh, conductive instead, okay, electroconstructive. Uh, photomagnetic so all these are different types of sensors depending on how it uh, what it is reading uh, in terms of the physical properties uh, from the from the real world and to what it is converting converting it so for example a thermoelastic a thermoelastic uh, okay let me put a question uh, to either uh, to the class anyone with an answer can uh, switch on the mic and and answer what is what how do you explain a thermoelastic sensor what it do? Anyone? A thermoelastic. What happened in a thermoelastic sensor? Anyone? Sorry? So I think that uh, when an, a material is in elasticity is affected in relative to the uh, temperature. Exactly. You're right. So what happened here, depending on heat in the environment, so it's thermo, thermo means uh, heat, temperature. So depending on heat in the environment, what is happening? The material is expanding, it is elastic, it is uh, 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 expanding like, okay? So this is called a thermo, thermoelastic uh, a sensor. Depending on heat, something is expanding uh, a, some, a, within within the, the, the material. So this is how we, how we, uh, we recognize the different photo means light, you know, photo means photoelectric means uh, depending on the light that we are getting, this is being converted into some electric uh, levels, for example. This is how you recognize those, those sensors. Let me continue. 
okay, classification by specification, okay, depending on its accuracy. There are some sensors that are high, highly accurate, less accurate sensitivity. There are some sensors that are highly sensible to some element, some less stability, response time. Okay, some sensors that uh, read very far, some sensors take more time. So this is this is uh, in terms of the specification. Uh, by application area, okay, classification area of application, we have, for example, energy sensor, heat sensor, consumer products, uh, marine sensor, space, automotive. So all these are the types of application for, for sensors. Okay, so I've told you about this uh, primary transistor record. This is the main thing in a, a, in a sensor that transform whatever it is getting from the physical environment into another form of, of energy. So a device that converts energy in one form to into another a form. You have conventional transducers. These are uh, large but generally more reliable. For example, a thermocouple, a compass. Okay, give you very precise uh, a reading. Okay, a thermocouple or, or a compass. Uh, these are physical uh, transducers. But then we, have, we are more concerned with this one microelectronic sen uh, sensors that do more or less the same thing that those apparatus was doing but now we have a sensor doing it for a for a form so it's uh, for example photodiode or phototransistor so photons energy light it convert light into some voltage for some voltage uh, level okay for example infrared detectors or pro proximity intrusion alarms you know there are those sensors that uh, already detect if there is some movement or whatever. So very often those sensors, they are, they are called phototransistors or photodiode. So then you have uh, piezo resistors, pressure a sensors. So depending on some pressure being applied by air or a particular fluid, it will give you some reading. Micro accelerometers, okay? This is for vibration, okay? When uh, something is moving, vibrating or or moving in a particular direction, then you get uh, some some reading. You have chemical sensors depending on uh, what uh, uh, what are you reading. So O2, CO2, carbon uh, uh, dioxide, carbon monoxide, uh, oxygen levels, nitrates, whatever. Okay, it can measure the level of these uh, gases, for example, in, a, in in the air. So these are examples of of microelectronic uh, sensors. And, and I've, I've already explained to you in those sensors, there are some sensing elements that react to this physical uh, phenomenon. Okay, so this was sensors, uh, our discussion on, uh, on, on sensors, different types of sensors. And uh, especially this is very important after you, this functional relationship that, uh, that exists, the different types of, of, of sensors. Let me move now to a second point of discussion for today, which is uh, actuators. What I've told you about uh, about an actuator. Anyone, uh, what is an actuator? If you have to explain in very simple language, what is an actuator? How it differentiates? Uh, let me pick someone from the class just to ensure that everyone around. Okay. Uh, Yuvraj Sigula, around. Yes. Okay. So tell me in very simple term, what is your understanding of uh, an actuator? What is an actuator? How it compare with a sensor? So an actuator converts a digital signal to an analog one to perform an action. Okay, good. So I was looking for this perform an action. It perform an action on the real world. For example, an, an electronic arm opening a door, whatever is happening, or opening some uh, shaft or, or some, some window in order for air to get in, or trigger an alarm. Trigger an alarm is a very simple example of, uh, a, of, an, of an actuator starting an alarm, emitting a sound, for, a, for example. Yes, you're, you're right. So this is, this is an actuator uh, that do something in the uh, in the real world. Hardware devices that convert a controller command signal. We are getting an, uh, a digital signal from the microcontroller and changing it into a physical parameter. Move doing a, a particular movement, moving something, placing something. So this is uh, uh, the task of an actuator. The change is usually mechanical. Yes, 
this is very often the case, the change is usually mechanical. It moves something, it, uh, it uh, light a bulb, for example, it, uh, it uh, triggers something, an alarm, so very often it is physical. So an actuator is also a transducer because it changes one type of a physical quantity into an alternative form. So this is also called a transducer, but a, a different types of, of transducer. So an actuator is really activated by low level command signal. Okay, you need to uh, transmit some voltage level to the actuator. So an amplifier may be required to provide sufficient power to drive an actuator. You understand a sensor can be very low power because it is just sensing reading. But as an actuator, we have to perform an action in the real world. And depending, for example, lifting something, lifting a car, uh, it can be very challenging. So you will need to provide the necessary power in order to move uh, the, the actuator. So let me continue. So this is basically uh, how an actuator works, just like I've shown to you how a sensor works. So there is an input uh, a signal. This is to, to trigger the actuator to start something. It is signal or amplification. Then this is the actuator a part. Okay. Uh, very often now to perform the movement. Uh, for example, an arm opening a door. Okay. A, a mechanical arm opening a door. So it can be uh, done by an electric. Okay, the, through the there is a motor that the turn uh, when it gets electricity, and uh, when you turn the motor, it start pulling. It start pulling the the door, it, or it can be hydraulic. Hydraulic. Uh, anyone uh, who is familiar with uh, those terms, what is a hydraulic? Well, when we talk about hydraulic, this what how how the the arm operate by fluids inside. Yeah. The... By, yeah. Yes, it by fluids inside the pipe, so it translates uh, the movement of a fluid into a movement in the real world. Okay, good. Yeah. So when we talk about hydraulic, it's a very often uh, a, a a liquid. Okay, that is being uh, pushed. Okay, and and when the liquid is pushed, it, it make a force. Okay, convert into a force that is opening the door. Uh, for example, and the liquid, liquid most often it can be, for example, in your car you have oil that uh, do this uh, uh, this uh, job of uh, of uh, some mechanical mechanical movement. Okay, any another person uh, can tell me about uh, no, we call it pneumatic pneumatic. How it works? Well, what what it is using in order to cause a movement? Pneumatic. Anyone? Air. Yeah, compression of air. Here we are talking about compression, compression of air. When you compress air, it generates a force. So and and perform a movement in the in the real world. You will. I, I will come back to this term because uh, our actuators normally uh, work with those. Uh, a, a, a physical properties we are going to see so basically this is our mechanism depending on what we are pushing what we are uh, turning and what we are the mechanical part which is being done and then this is going something to happen to happen in the in the real world why my my arm is expanding or or, or contracting okay or whether it is expanding to uh, to close the door expand it goes uh, further in order to close the door or it retrieve, it contract in order to open to open a door, for example. Okay, there are different types of actuators now well, to perform those motion, those movement. Uh, very often we classify actuators in the type of motion it perform. Okay, a linear uh, actuator it moves, for example, in a in a line. A linear means uh, in a straight uh, straight line, for example. Um, for you, for you, our sensors, they are our instead actuators, they are rotary. Rotary, uh, you, you understand it, it performs a circular, a circular movement, or one axis, two axes, it, uh, it operates in, into a free, a free axis. So you will see examples of, of this. So, yes, a, just a few seconds earlier, we were discussing about this. Okay, we have electrical, a, actu electrical actuators that turn, that move based on the electric power that it is, that it is uh, getting, okay? We have servo motors, we have AC motors, stepper motors, but I'll make a difference between stepper motors and servo motors in a few seconds, okay? These are electric motors that turn uh, at a particular speed, at a particular angle, okay? The, and it turn by 
uh, because it has been produced, uh, it has been given some some electric uh, power. Okay, or solenoid in terms of man uh, magnetic. Or second, second type of uh, actuators we have hydraulic. Hydraulic. One of your friend mentioned it uses hydraulic fluid. Okay, uh, it can be well water or a particular oil or whatever to amplify the controller command signal. Okay, whatever signal it has got, it amplify it, uh, it expand or con a contract in order to cause to cause a, a movement. Okay, and uh, pneumatic uh, actuators it use compressed air. Okay, because compressed air generates force as the driving as a driving a force in order to move something. Okay, this also we use uh, a, we use uh, a lot. Okay, so these are examples of uh, linear linear action in a straight line, a cylinder, hydraulic cylinder, pneumatic cylinder. You see here, a hydraulic normally tends to generate a very high force. Okay, if you want to to lift something or whatever, you can be using hydraulic, but the speed normally tends to be lower. Okay, low low speed. It can move something uh, very heavy, but slowly. So this is what's it. Uh, you have leaks, it goes noise, it is quite bulky and everything. So pneumatic, it is medium force, not so low, but not so high as a, as well. But this one can be of high high speed. Very quickly, you can move uh, a, some, a something. Again, it is cause some noise and then it is quite heavy. Okay, so this is in terms of cylinders for linear action. Solenoid, it, it is electromagnetic, so using magnetic, uh, magnetic foil a force of magnets, okay? So normally this tends to be low force because magnets do not generate that high high force. Okay, medium speed, it is, qu it is quiet. So this is a good thing about it. It is quiet, it don't, don't make a lot of noise clean. It is can be very small and cheap. So this is why many of our sensors, they are electromagnetic uh, sensors, okay? Or you have linear slides, slides uh, electromechanical depending on some uh, electric voltage level it will perform a mechanical movement for example uh, an automatic gate will use an electromechanical uh, mechanism it can be it can be medium force low to medium speed okay not so uh, not, not so force it is quite clean medium size and and, and cost these are examples of rotary actuators that perform uh, rotary movement in, the, in, a, in, a, in a circle. So you can have mot most motors, obviously, they, they perform a, a rotary uh, a movement, okay? So, and which can be converted to linear, obviously, through a pulleys, through a particular mechanism. So again, here it can be hydraulic, pneumatic, and electric. So you need to understand, for example, for a motor, when it is hydraulic, what kind of characteristic it gives you? When it is pneumatic, what kind of characteristic? I recall an exam question. I have all students to compare different types of motors in terms of hydraulic, pneumatic, and electric, and give me their characteristic. Okay, so you need to understand this. Huh? Well, it's, it's important for you because you are sensor students, and and you deal with these uh, motors a lot. Uh, even in the lab, we are going to use uh, one uh, one of those very simple stepper motors, for example. Okay, so uh, a hydraulic motor. Okay, it is high power after you hydraulic anyway. Even here you see hydraulic high force. Hydraulic motor high power. Okay, but the speed is not so high in this case. Low to medium medium speed and medium precision. There is noise, they generate uh, a noise and it is quite bulky. Pneumatic uh, bulky, you know why? Because there is a liquid that needs to be manipulated. So pneumatic is uh, by compression of air. It is medium power. It is high speed. This one is high speed, can generate very high speed, but low low precision, can be noisy. It is bulky as, as well. Otherwise, electric motor, most uh, in our case, we are going to use electric motor, doesn't generate so much power, okay? Uh, it is medium speed, but high precision, quiet, clean, small, cheap. So these are some, some characteristics. Depending on what you want to do, which system you want to implement, you will choose your corresponding, your corresponding actuator or, or motors. This is an example of an electric motor, a specific kind of electric motor, which is called a stepper motor. A stepper, a step. It's come from the word step. So what it happened, this is the motor. It moves one at a time, a one step at a time. So you see here, this comes here, this comes here. So it, it moves in this direction. So it, it, has, it has performed one step like this, one step, one step. 
Okay, so uh, DC pulses directly on it result in fixed angular motion. Okay, we put power and these two they come to next to next uh, to each other. So pair of calls activated low it's low speed to avoid ringing. Okay, because otherwise uh, you will have movement that will cause a ringing move, movement. This is why normally it need to be to move quite uh, quite slowly. So lower power and holding holding top. So uh, it doesn't consume lots of uh, lots of power to do this this moment. So this is called stepper motor. Very often used in my main system, we use stepper motors. You have another kind of motor that is called servo motors. Okay, these are the two popular types of motors: stepper motor and servo servo motors. So require feedback to operate. For example, a tachometer, a, taco a particular uh, position. So it is speed controlled by the frequency of power supply to the, to the motor. This one is more powerful compared to a stepper motor. So when it is DC current, alternating current or DC a direct current, so it's speed controlled by the magnitude of voltage, depending on what is uh, what magnitude of voltage, uh, amount of voltage you're supplying to the motor, this will generate the, the, the particular, a particular a force. Let me see, I was having a look, this is a, uh, in terms of diagram, you see here, this is a stepper motor turning something here by a particular angle, so rot rotation of uh, the lead screw, a particular moment. Whereas here, this is a servo motor, okay, again turning at a particular a angle, but in a rotation moment. Let me show to you, I was checking a particular video on the difference between a servo and a stepper motor. Have a look at, at this. Uh, so, uh, is there supposed to be any sound in the video? Excuse me? Uh, is there supposed to be any sound uh, from the video? I'm, I'm not hearing anything. I, the, the others, are you able to, to get that sound? Yep. No. Okay, so while we are playing directly, uh, you, you are getting only the, the image. Yep. Okay, so what I will do, let me copy this link. I'll uh, send you by chat. You can, uh, you can view it later. Okay, no, no issues about it. Let me send it by chat. You can view this. It is. Okay, no, no issues. Uh, let me continue. A, you have a video that explains to you the, differ the technical difference between a stepper motor and and a servo, a, a servo motor. Okay, we have both. I think uh, we use in the lab. I, I, I recall one lab uh, sheet on on stepper motor for sure. Turning a particular a hand at in, at specific angle, at a specific angle. So uh, writing a program that do this movement and everything. We are going. Uh, we are going to do it in the uh, in the lab. No worries about about. It. Let me continue. Okay, so in terms of uh, motion control, you have other actuators. We are discussing actuators here, different sorts of actuators. You have uh, actuators that perform a particular movement, okay? Uh, a, something that we call mechanical cams. Shape of the cam determine motion of the follower. So this is a follower. Uh, let me show it to you. This is a follower. Depending on the, you see here, this is the shape of the cam. The, the, uh, the device that will be rotating. And you notice there's a, a slope here. When it moves here, it will be moving this uh, follower in this direction here in the, by doing this shape. Let me, I was looking at an animation. Hopefully we, you can see it. This is tachometer, we have already seen. This is a uh, mister. Okay, have a look at this diagram. Are you able to see this diagram? This yes. one? Okay, yes. so you see, depending on the shape of this cam, and it is performing, this is the follower. Down here is the follower. So it's performing a particular movement with the, with the follower. So this is called a mechanical cam. 
So it comes is a rotating and, or, or sliding piece in the mechanical linkage used especially in transforming rotary movement into linear motion. So which what this one is a rotary, up is a rotary movement, and down you see here, this is a linear, linear motion in a straight line. It is moving it in a in a straight line, but but obviously at different speed and depending on the shape of the cam, which is uh, a which is up. So this is called mechanical a mechanical cam, or you can have mechanical stops as well, depending on what is is a, a piston. Okay, and this is the, the the stop. Depending on the position, it will stop at a particular place. It cannot be more than this. It cannot be less than this. It will move only in this in this between those two between those two lines here. So this is called mechanical mechanical stops. Okay, normally this is the follower. The yellow part here is the follower, and these are the stops. It will move only within within this. So you have actuators uh, like this as as well okay so you can have point to point okay i know that i have not given you any break i will finish slightly earlier so as you can uh, we can finish early you can take your time off that okay so yes continue uh, i will finish with actuators then microcontrollers i will do it next uh, next week so you can have uh, actuators that perform point to point so from here to here but then it goes through this point here from here to here okay so starting and ending points are given but the path between them is not controlled how it is going from here to here it needs to move from here to point from point a to point b but how it is doing it this is not this is not controlled okay so advantage is simple inexpensive controller this type of uh, of actuator but we can have uh, uh, actuator that perform continuous path as well both endpoints and path between them are controlled so you control the path Whereas where it should start and where it should stop as well. Okay, so complex complex shape capability is uh, is possible with this with this one. So at the end of the day, now I finish now with uh, with actuators as well. Okay, so at the end of the day, your whatever your sensors, even actuators, it needs to be connected to a microcontroller. In the lab, I was explaining microcontrollers. Uh, the signal needs to go to a microcontroller where you write your program and then you will perform corresponding operations. So, uh, and I've told you also that your sensors normally is reading analog signal. May, many microcontrollers have inbuilt uh, analog digital uh, a converter. So the inputs that we are getting from our sensors needs to be converted to digital, to digital form here. And uh, the digital form that we is generating from our uh, microcontroller, we should, uh, we should have a particular ports to read uh, to read those those data, a, what we call serial input output ports. Okay, we have two types of uh, a, of, of ports. You have synchronous, synchronous meaning it is being read by following a particular clock. So uh, both your microcontroller and the device uh, sensor they are synchronized. They are synchronized with a particular a, a clock. Okay, and must match byte format stops uh, start bits. All these are uh, are checked. Okay, whereas you can have asynchronous uh, port as well, where no clock is used, more common for uh, communication than, than data for, for, for this one. So much, much board rate between uh, a transmission protocol and, and everything. You have other types of uh, interface with frequency encoded, this we'll discuss later. Uh, a connecting smart sensors to your network, your PC, so more or less here to the microcontroller, here to the to, to the PC. So small sensor sensors with inbuilt signal processing and communication. So we 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 have something called data acquisition cards that we use PC card with analog and digital AIO. So this is giving connection from the sensor system to your computer, for example. So you have communication links. So basically, uh, we use for asynchronous real communication a universal asynchronous to receive and transmit this is a protocol if you, if you may say so that uh, that we use very often and for synchronous serial communication we use spi serial peripheral interface okay between your sensor system and and the computer okay uh, what else here let me proceed to the next uh, slide yeah one last point of discussion concerning uh, uh, our sensors and actuators uh, you know when those sensors they are manufactured okay 
there is a how do we call it a, a fact sheet there is a fact sheet that is that that that, that, that they provide okay with test results that is when uh, earlier you recall i was talking about transfer function what is a functional relationship that uh, exists between the stimulus in the real environment and the uh, voltage level that the sensor is giving is giving us sometimes uh, not sometimes very often there are some discrepancies there are some uh, not fault but there are some uh, uh, a difference in the actual value that it should be giving me uh, compared to, uh, to the what, whatever it is it is uh, a reading so there is a difference between between those between those two so when you buy a sensor when you are using a sensor basically let's say you are using a sensor to you have bought a sensor to measure a water depth that is level of water in a uh, in a container in a in a uh in, in, a, in a particular in a particular container and then you have you you put in in there a water probe okay a depth uh, a depth sensor okay so in this case when the water rises to a particular level it should translate to some i don't know centimeter meter whatever normally translating the voltage level the voltage level transfer in terms of some meter or or, or, or centimeter very often what happened uh it is the water is increasing but then the value the voltage that you're getting and value that you're getting eventually is not matching the what it is supposed to be giving why because because there has been some uh you know those elements sensing element that we use in those in those sensors uh the sensibility has changed has uh, has modified slightly you know when when those sensors they are being shipped they are being uh, manufactured they are being they are they are put in boxes they come to our place there can be some slight variation in their sensing a sensing element when they are exposed to high temperature things like this to pressure whatever the uh, the sensing element normally get uh, get distorted some place sometimes so what we need to do we can still use the, the sensors what you need to do you need to calibrate your sensor to make it give you the correct reading, to know that this change in the environment, this is the reading that it will that it will read, that it will read. So very often, how do we do calibration? Okay, I have a sensor, for example, I have a temperature sensor. What do you think we we can use in order to calibrate my temperature sensor? Anyone? To see to it. Yeah. A thermometer. Yeah. yeah, someone said uh, a thermo thermometer. So what you do, you have your temperature sensor. It's supposed to be reading temperature. What you do, you take it in a reliable thermometer, you measure a, a, the temperature of water. Let's say we are measuring temperature of water. You put your sensor, you put your thermometer, both. Okay. And then you see which reading your sensor is giving and which reading the thermometers reading then you correlate those two, uh, those two values this is to calibrate your uh, your your sensor you just to make sure that the reaction of your sensing element is corresponding to a particular to a particular a uh, temperature you see here sensors can exhibit non ideal effects this is what i've just explained to you the sensing element not reacting as supposed to be so we are, what we need to do we need to offset nominal output not equal to nominal parameter value so these two they are not matching so there's a non-linear relationship. I put not linear with parameter changes. Normally, as the water temperature increases, the voltage level or whatever should increase corresponding. This should have some corresponding increase. So, uh, so when it is non-linear, you need to uh, remove this uh, a, a noise that is there. So cross-parameter sensitivity, secondary output variation with for example, temperature. So calibration, what it is the process of calibration? Adjusting output to match parameter. Adjust the output in order to match a particular, a particular parameter. So analog signal conditioning. Use it, oh yeah, work on the, the fact sheet that I was telling you earlier. Uh, actually, it is called a lookup table. Very often when you buy sensors, you can check on the website uh, of the provider. They give you this lookup table. That is, this value should correspond to this uh, uh, output. This value should correspond to that particular uh, uh, output. 
Okay, so you have a formulation for digital calibration down. So you need to compensate for the lack of oversensitivity of your of your sensor. So remove secondary sensitivities. This is what I was just explained explaining to you. So must have sensitivities characterized. That is, you need to know by how much your sensing element should expand, should contract, should give you a particular voltage voltage level. Then you remove uh, with polynomial evaluation. This is using formulation in order to remove the noise or the non-linearity that you are getting with respect to your sensor. So basically, in simple term, when you buy a sensor, you need to check whether it is giving correct result. How to check it? Compare it with the real equipment. Compare it with, a, uh, with some uh, equipment that you know works well, okay, that is robust, and then you, you match your two reading and you make it that when it is giving this value here, the other, it is matching with the other apparatus as an answer. So this is for, excuse me, sensor, sensor calibration. Okay, so it's uh, exactly known. I've not given you your, a, your break. So you have a, we have a low spot in this lecture that we'll continue next week, which is on, on micro, a, microcontrollers, okay? So in terms of the lecture, uh, we will stop somewhere here. Uh, let me comment on, uh, so we are doing our chapter two in this, uh, in this module. So you see here in this lecture, there are some theoretical background that you need to master. It's not only uh, getting a few sensors connected to a microcontroller or whatever. You need to understand the theory behind the types of sensors, the classification, a transfer relationship, uh, uh, a difference between a stepper motor, a servo motor. So these are things that uh, you will need eventually to master because you will be examining on those aspects as, uh, as well. So this is one. Uh, second, uh, recall you have an assignment submission scheduled for Wednesday. Okay. It is top 10 microcontrollers, if I'm not mistaken. So this is second for this module. Uh, third, uh, uh, have your name on this attendance sheet that I've already shared, all of you, those who join late. There is an attendance sheet that has been shared. Okay, it is the link is on the chat of this uh, uh, classroom here. So make sure you have your name placed on the attendance sheet. Fourth, uh, we are meeting this week on Thursday to continue our discussion on microcontrollers. More specifically, we are going to discuss about uh, the Arduino a micro, microcontroller. We are going to explore further the Arduino microcontroller. Very soon, uh, we are going also to program our, our Arduino, okay? So basically, it will be an introduction to Arduino on, on Thursday because on uh, last week in the lab it was in, on microcontrollers in general. This week it will be specifically on, on uh, your or genome. Okay, so in, any question from you? About the lecture, about the lab? I will again tell you to stay connected, okay? And uh, I see 38 students present in the, in, in, in the lecture there, I will compare it with my attendant, attendance suite as, a, as well. Uh, you see, I'm trying also to interact with you even during the lectures through different questions, been pointing to specific names as, uh, as well. Okay, so I hope uh, you're able to follow. Uh, it is not far from what we would have uh, uh, done in a classroom as well. So for me, it is more or less okay. Uh, so as you are, uh, attentive as far as you are following seriously the the online in the online lecture uh, let me have a few comments from you how, how is the online going on at least with respect to my module yes anyone is it okay is it uh, not so okay yes it's fine yes you're able to... yeah which comment i've heard uh, someone said it's fine any other comment? So I take it that you are able to follow a uh, to follow the lectures a uh, uh, properly, okay? And anyway, we are meeting in the lab. Don't miss your lab. I've noticed there were some absences in the first lab already, which is bad news, okay? Because uh, uh, the practical is very very important in this uh, in this module in the build up 
for you to be able to program eventually sensor sensor system and uh, i can already tell you both uh, uh, in the test i'm not so sure but in the exam you will have uh, arduino programming that will be there as well definitely it was there in my exam paper last year it will be there next this year as uh, as as well so you need to be very uh, connected with your uh, with your lab as uh, as well because i recall uh, last uh, week in the lab uh, in one batch there was only 18 something so I, i'm i'm doing the necessary follow up okay with respect to the attendance and everything so the responsibility is on you to stay connected and to attend both your lecture and your uh, and in the lab okay if uh, you don't have any question any in, in, any question uh, that you may that you may be having if not uh, i will uh, stop uh, the lecture uh, the lecture here i will uh, stop the recording <laughs>